he traces the theme through the capture and coordination of revolutionary political, revolutionary exile politics, the disintegration of the British party political order, the emergence of what he terms parliamentary Bonapartism, and concomitantly the rise of ministerial government. The vicissitudes of post-1848, the working class politics and the struggle in which Marx himself is deeply involved to reconstitute Chartism, ultimately a failed enterprise. And of course, the India question. Framing the 1853 India writings in terms of Marx's wider concerns, as I do, already places me at odds with the literature that more or less invariably discusses these writings in 20th century anti-imperialist terms. For the past century, communists, having first liquidated Marx's and Marxism's category of imperialism, turned Marx into a more or less reliable advocate for decolonization, i.e. largely judge his works in terms of anti-colonial nationalism. Because these writings were only discovered and republished by international socialists in the 1930s, by which time, in a significant, to a significant degree, the world revolution was already both lost and abandoned. Marx's journalism touching on India has really had no other interpretation. We can talk about the 20th century republication and reception history of these writings in the Q&A if you like. In 1853, there was widespread public debate respecting the India question. Close, close in 1853, there was widespread public debate respecting the India question, both in Britain and significantly for the first time in India itself. The East India Company's charter was expired. But what did that signify, given that in 1833, the company had already been deprived of its commercial functions? And what and was seemingly akin to a colonial office, just separate for India. Of course, the company, in some sense, remained in operation. It had a board elected by stockholders that governed the personnel of the corporation, which is to say, the court of directors exercised vast powers of patronage by hiring the staff, allotting lucrative posts in the Indian Empire. And the company continued to pay dividends to stockholders. It was supervised, it is true, by a crown minister and crown appointed board of control, as it was called. And that body nominally oversaw the company, especially as regards major questions of war and peace. But usually the board of control pushed the company into war. Though the board of control through the Board of Control, company directors corresponded with and nominally exercised control over the Governor General in Calcutta and the governors of the major presidencies, the head of the heads of the far-flung company state in India. But how central was the company per se to the India question in 1853? And why was it that, as Marx observed, for the first time since 1783, the India question has become a ministerial one in England. What was the debate at the time? Certainly one issue was the seemingly endless war in India. Another was the lack of growth and the need for investment. We know that that year, Marx read, for instance, John Chapman's The Cotton and Commerce of India, a sweeping criticism of the company by the former chief engineer of the Great Indian Peninsular Railway. 
and the Bombay Association's chief political agent in London. As Marx remarked, in all their attempts to apply capital to India, would-be investors meet with impediments and chicanery on the part of the Indian authorities. Yeah, oh, you see the, it's a misprint. That's from the copy in at the University of Virginia. That's a, that's his, um, you know, byline. That's, these are taken from the actual newspapers. As for war, the mid 19th century is sometimes regarded by historians as a period when free trade doctrines came to prevail against militarism and imperialist expansion. And indeed, in India, there was a lull in British aggression after the Third Anglo Maratha War of 1817 to 1819. The conflict that placed the hinterland of Bombay definitively under British suzerainty. But despite that law, the post reform bill period, the period after the abolition of the company as a commercial body, witnessed a dramatic series of wars in India. As Marx observed, during the period from 1838 to 1849, in the Sikh and Afghan wars, the British, sub, the British rule subjected to definitive possession the ethnographical, political, and military frontiers of the East Indian continent by the compulsory annexation of the Punjab and of Sindh. These were possessions indispensable to repulse any invading force issuing from Central Asia and indispensable against Russia advancing to the frontiers of Persia. During this last decennium, there have been added to the British Indian territory 160,000 square miles with a population of 8.5 million souls. As to the interior, all the native states have now become surrounded by British possessions, subjected to British suzerainty under various forms. As to its exterior, India is now finished. It is only since 1849 that the one great Anglo-Indian empire has existed." Close quote. And for Marx, it was no coincidence that these wars and the aggressive annexation of princely states' territories that accompanied them uh, coincided with the emerging crisis of liberalism at home. The period of the emergence of Chartism and of what Marx and Engels called simply class struggle. The old notion that the new commercial form of society would gradually pacify feudal warmongering was for Marx giving way to a new understanding of a specifically capitalist authoritarianism, statism, and militarism. And this could be and was, in his view, projected into the colonial theater. Hence, the first Afghan war, straight through to the second Burmese war of 1852, he viewed as driven by new imperatives. One of the most widely circulated pamphlets at the time of the renewal was that of Richard Cobden, titled simply, How Wars Are Got Up in India. But the, but the discontent was more diffuse than just opposition to economic stagnation and militarism. The charter renewal debate surfaced the pent up grievances of decades. After all, normally India was scarcely permitted to be known, much less debated in Britain. Though the Board of Control exercised a kind of authority over it, this didn't really bring the East India Company under parliamentary scrutiny. That's really important to understand. That it's practically impossible for parliament to get documents out of the East India Company in this period. 
Rather, it fed, it fed the increasing independence of the ministry from Parliament. Ministerial supervision by the Board of Control had subordinated the company to the state, in short, but in no sense to society, whether British or Indian. As Marx remarked, this is one of my favorite passages from this whole body of writing. Since the days of Aristotle, the world has been inundated with a frightful quantity of dissertations, ingenious or absurd as it may happen on that question, who shall be the governing power? But for the first time in the annals of history, the Senate of a people ruling over another people, numbering 156 millions of human beings and spreading over 1.3 million square miles have put their heads together in solemn and public congregation in order to answer the irregular question, who among us is the actual governing power over that foreign people of 150 million souls? And there was no Oedipus in the British Senate capable of extricating this riddle. The whole debate exclusively twined around it as although a division would take place, yet no definition of the Indian government was arrived at, unquote. The company was a chartered body operating effectively outside of parliamentary and thus public scrutiny. When India was legislated for, it was for a stipulated number of years. It was only likely to come up in parliament after that uh, because parliament lacked regular access to information in the event of a major crisis, as with the staggering defeat inflicted upon the company's armies during the retreat from Kabul during the first Afghan war. So even though it dismantled the last of the trade of the company's trade monopolies, in passing the India Bill of 1833, the reformed parliament had once again and deliberately placed Indian questions beyond its own reach for a period of 20 years. So when 1853 finally rolled around, those anxious for thoroughgoing reform, metropolitan and Indian liberals, and watching from the wings, working class radicals, had long been anticipating the charter's expiration. All understood that, as Marx put it, not only had England in its conquest of India been, quote, actuated by only the vilest of interests, unquote, it had been stupid in its manner of enforcing them, unquote. This view was the common inheritance of liberalism, stretching back through Buckingham to Ron Mohan Roy, back through James Mill to Adam Smith and the Abbe Raynal. But what would be the critique if there was universal suffrage in Britain if the House of Commons was in that sense fully representative and the constituted and vocal criticism emerging from society was given full scope. That's in some sense what Marx is projecting uh, as the uh, in a sense basis for critique. Those discontented with the East India Company's rule prominently included British manufacturing interests centered in the Manchester Chamber of Commerce and headed by the MP for Manchester, John Bright. In 1853, the discontented also included, and this was novel, an emerging public opinion in India as given organized expression for the first time by the commercial elite of the major presidency towns. Metropolitan manufacturing interests were indeed actually at this time linking up with Indian mercantile interests. In the lead up to the charter's renewal, newspapers in both Britain and India teamed with articles critical of company government, and many of them, many of these were planted, of course, uh, were paid for by liberals in Britain and India. In short, Outraged by company misrule, 
was nothing less than what Marx called the public opinion of two worlds. In the wake of 1833, there emerged something of a moral critique of British Indian policy led by the lights of anti-slavery activist George Thompson. But by the end of the 1840s, an older economic critique had revived, albeit unchanged conditions. As Marx observed, at the same rate at which the cotton manufacturers became a vital interest for the whole frame of Great Britain, for the whole social frame of Great Britain, East India became a vital interest for the British cotton manufacturer. Unquote. Manchester factory owners looked to India for customers. They were shocked at India's Indians' scanty purchasing power, even as they regarded India as a source of raw cotton right for expansion. For years prior to the 1853 debates, John Bright never interview witnesses in Britain. In 1850, he explained the significance of cotton to the British economy as follows. The cotton trade employs directly and indirectly, certainly not less and probably much more than two millions of the population of the United Kingdom, with an amount of capital far greater than can be found engaged in any other branch of manufacturing industry. Whilst the total exports of the country in 1849, were 63 million pounds sterling. The cotton trade alone furnished not less than 26 million pounds, or 42 percent. But liberals' abhorrence of slavery led them to seek an alternative to the cotton supply from America. Whence was drawn at the time over three quarters of the Lancaster Mills raw material. As Bright remarked, it will be impossible in any country, and most of all in America, to keep near three millions of the population permanently in bondage. By whatever means, slavery shall be abolished in the United States, whether by insurrection or by some great measure of justice on the part of the government, it is certain the cultivation of cotton must be materially interfered with for a considerable time, unquote. And American supplies have fluctuated wildly in recent years, but impeding the Indian raw, the Indian raw cotton supply, British manufacturers like John Bright asked, stood the appallingly poor transportation system then prevailing in the country, and perhaps more crucially, the lack of security of property and person that the company's rule entailed. They thought they sought, among other goals, an Indian government directly responsible to Parliament to make possible the protection of law for Indians and Europeans resident in India, a massive increase in investment in roads and railways and the complete overhaul of the revenue system. Prominent Indians of the major residency towns of Bombay, Madras, and Calcutta, forming themselves into the Bombay Association, Madras Native Association, and Calcutta's British Indian Association, respectively, wanted the same thing. They petitioned Parliament through their new form associations, in addition to raising money to pay agents in England to present and publicize those petitions, and more generally to plant articles in the press, commission the publication pamphlets, and in general, conduct a full spectrum publicity campaign. As can be seen, for instance, in Jagannath Shankar Sheikh's correspondence with John Chapman, 
there was considerable coordination between the efforts of Indian and metropolitan liberals. English, no less and no different than Indian liberals, were keen to see governing councils and the upper levels of the administrative bureaucracy opened to native participation, both just as both wanted a decrease in taxes, rationalization of the law, and as I said, investment in railways, roads, irrigation tanks, dams, and the like. In addition to the petitions sent by the newly formed Indian Civil Society Associations, liberal efforts found expression in the Metropole in the India Reform Society, which was modeled on other reform initiatives going back to the anti-slavery campaign and the anti-corn law league. The India Reform Society, which included some 36 members of parliament, issued a series of non-scaling pamphlets this is the most famous one, India, its government under the bureaucracy. That was reprinted, I think, for the last time in 1924, which in, issued a series of nine scathing pamphlets that together formed the staple of all liberal critiques of imperialism straight down to the early 20th century. Observing these liberal initiatives from the wings the belief, were the beleaguered forces of proletarian socialism, among them the remnants of British Chartism and revolutionary exiles, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. At the time he wrote his series on the Charter Renewal, Marx was just beginning a new position as London correspondence with the American Republican newspaper, the New York Tribune in addition to which he actively collaborated with the English Chartist leader, Ernest Jones, who then actively, was then actively engaged in attempting to reconstitute with Marx and Engels' very active assistance and encouragement, the great British revolutionary working class movement. Jones edited the People's Paper in 1953, was actively canvassing amongst increasingly militant English trade unionists to recover charges of strength in the mill districts on the basis of the revolutionary experience and in the wake of, in, in the base of the revolutionary experience of 1848 and of course that of the fiasco of the 1848 presentation of the charter. So what did Marx have to say about the Indian question? Is the Marxist critique of overseas empire really any different from liberals? What was imperialism for Marx? What, if anything, did it have to do with overseas tolerance, since, after all, the model is Second Empire France? And how did Marx's conception differ from the liberals. These questions that Marx's and indeed British socialism's critical address to the Indian question of 1853 raised actually have scarcely been posed, given the way that in its self liquidation, the 20th century revolution has swallowed the 19th century revolution whole. Instead, is, as I have suggested, almost 100 years of editing and writing on Marxist Tribune dispatches has contented itself with asking questions exogenous to Marxist concerns. He was engaged, first of all, yes, in surviving the counter revolution, but beyond that, in bringing to bear the lessons of the revolution of 1848 to the development of what he had come to recognize as necessary a class independent socialist party or parties prosecuting contradictions in and through the battle of democracy. In that sense, he was deeply engaged in developing what would become the Marxist critique of democracy. Marx is ultimately unsound on decolonization, which is why he's accused of being orientalist and everything else, because he is unsound on those concerns because 
captured as they became in the 20th century by a bulkish, autarkic, capitalist political imagination. Marx's critique of imperialism was abandoned. That critique would ultimately center on core capitalist states and the military and force that's concentrated in. And we must now admit, and indeed the admission is long overdue, that what the 20th century called anti-imperialism, which especially in its high new left or Maoist forms, supposedly at one time held out the promise of world revolution, now completely lies in ruin as a strategy for socialism today, more than half a century since the decolonization of most of Africa and Asia and nearly half a century since the Iranian revolution. Indeed, anti-imperialism, which may still get people jobs and tenure, operates as do all the disjectra membra of the new left today as a constituent ideology of the status quo. So rather than subjecting Marx to the criticism of the anti-imperialists, Marx is Eurocentric, Marx is is an Orientalist or the sophisticated Marxian version, he's a unilinearist, unilinearist, or as the kids just say today, a white supremacist. My book seeks to grant Marx the opportunity to criticize us confused and disoriented denizens of the present. Part of this demands recovering what Marx meant by his terms. What it meant as far as the India question is concerned was not withdrawn from, but in some sense completing what Plassey began in the sense of completing the revolution in Bengal as it was termed in the 18th century by realizing and overcoming the crisis of the British Revolution through the institution, of course, of the institute of the dictatorship of the proletariat in the core capitalist states, above all in Britain itself. Now, maybe today that project is completely irrelevant, and I think we should really contemplate that. Um, in which case, I would say, let's stop abusing Marx. Right, and if, if we deem it to be irrelevant, let's leave it behind, but leave those categories behind. So maybe we are entirely beyond the Marxist project. Obviously, in some sense, we are, given that there is no working class movement for socialism anywhere in the world today. In which case, let's stop abusing this history. At the same time, if there is anything to be recovered from Marx's Marxism, from what prevailed prior to the stillbirth of the Third International, that should be identified. Bonapartism or imperialism are for Marx epochal categories, akin to say the category of capital. Both in note albeit in different registers, the coming into self-contradiction or proletarianization of bourgeois freedom. In identifying the state as the agent that, failing the proletarian revolution, is tasked with the management of the morbid symptoms of the self-contradiction of society, the category of imperialism specifies critically both the historical circumstance and negatively the revolutionary task, i.e. the necessity of the seizure of state power as an act and facilitation of the withering away of the state. In other words, it's absolutely central to the Marxist critique of anarchism. The writings on the renewal of the East India Company's charter, uh, on the renewal of the East India Company charter, present particular difficulties in this regard, 
in as much as they express imperialism in this sense only very symptomatically. The new intractability of the India question is what Marx, in what interests Marx. The India question was already intractable. It's in a sense the run, it's, it's like the light motif of British liberals. In fact, going further back than Adam Smith, if you are a British liberal, you hate the East Indian Company. Um, I, I once found a document where uh, a young admirer of Adam Smith says, you know, I, Adam Smith was sick and he was talking to me. And he said, I wish I could rise from this bed and go down to London one more time to deliver my Cartago est Belinda. My Carthage must be destroyed to Parliament, by which he meant the abolition of the East India Company. Right? That this was the Carth Carthage must be destroyed is what Pliny the Elder ended every speech on, right? It's like a hobby horse, right? Okay, blah, blah, blah. We have to do this in Rome. And by the way, we have to destroy Carthage. So I would argue that this is a constitutive element of British liberalism. It's already intractable. The crisis of the British Revolution was already bound up with the Indian question. Marx is interested is in how it's newly intractable. He attends closely to the details of an otherwise unremarkable episode in the history of empire in order to tease out the new and the telling from the seemingly pedestrian march of routine. What interests him is why the British cannot serve as an unconscious tool of history, why they cannot serve as an engine of bourgeois revolution around the world. India as a subject was very arguably the very opposite of that of the failure of the revolution of 1848, the theme on which he elaborated the category of imperialism. In, of course, the 18th premier of Louis Bonaparte. There he considers imperialism as the negative image of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Louis Bonaparte meets the necessity that the revolution would have to meet. Right. In events in France were, in other words, acute expressions of roiling revolutionary dynamics. Despite being relatively backward in comparison with Britain, the demiurge of the bourgeois cosmos, as Marx termed it, France was in the vanguard of political developments. And this is the original meaning of combined and uneven development. Right? France is both backward in, re in reference to England and it's in the vanguard. The India Company was, by contrast, arguably the most retrograde element in the British state, the core of its counter-revolutionary nature. After all, the ruling order only definitively undertook to bury the legacy of the English Revolution by provoking the Americans to revolt in the Boston Tea Party, to dump the East India Company's tea into the harbor. Still, and indeed because of this, the India question exemplified the world's historic significance of Eurocentric socialist revolution, what liberals often refer to as the weight of responsibility of Indian rule. In other words, the question that socialists would have to face is not unlike the question that liberals are already facing. The India question carried with it what Marx termed the debt Britain owed to the 18th century revolution. British politics, the prospect of the revival of Chartism, was the agency appointed to recruit the potential for the pacification of global social relations. Britain's working class would have to take the lead in the management of the international consequences of the proletarianization of bourgeois freedom or bourgeois cosmopolitanism. 
Marx, since I have edited Marx, I thought I would directly edit Marx here. This, these are the original newspapers. Uh, Marx crystallizes the question of the socialist revolution as heir to the bourgeois revolution in what is perhaps the most famous passage he wrote in the 1853 India series. And what I'm trying to draw out is just how much Marx sounds like a liberal, because of course he is. These small, in other words, this critique of Indian society is a liberal critique. By and large, these small stereotyped forms of social organism have been to the greater part dissolved and are disappearing. He's talking about village India, not so much through the brutal interference of the British tax gatherer and the British soldier as to the working of English steam and English free trade. Those family communities were based on domestic industry in that peculiar combination of hand weaving, hand spinning, and hand killing agriculture which gave them self-supporting power. English interference having placed the spinner in Lancashire and the weaver in Bengal, or sweeping away both Hindu spinner and weaver, dissolved these small semi-barbarian, semi-civilized communities by blowing up their economical basis and thus produced the greatest, and to speak the truth, the only social revolution ever heard of in Asia. Now, sickening as it must be to human feeling to witness those myriads of industrious, patriarchal, and inoffensive social organizations disorganized and dissolved into their units, thrown into a sea of woes, and their individual members losing at the same time their ancient form of civilization and their hereditary means of subsistence, we must not forget that these idyllic village communities, inoffensive though they may appear, had always been the solid foundation of Oriental despotism, that they restrained the human mind within the smallest possible compass, making it the unresisting tool of superstition, enslaving it beneath traditional rules, depriving it of all grandeur and historical energies. We must not forget the barbarian egotism which, concentrating on some miserable patch of land, had quietly witnessed the ruin of empires, the perpetuation of unspeakable cruelties, the massacre of the population of large towns, with no consideration bestowed upon them, that no more, no other consideration bestowed upon them than on natural events, itself the helpless prey of any aggressor who deigned to notice it at all. We must not forget that this undignified, stagnatory, and vegetative life, that this passive sort of existence invoked, on the other part, in contradistinction, wild, aimless, unbounded forces of destruction, and rendered murder itself a religious rite in Hindustan. We must not forget that these little communities were contaminated by distinctions, by caste, and by slavery, and that they subjected man to external circumstances instead of elevated man to the sovereign of circumstances, that they transformed the self-developing social state into a never-changing natural destiny, and thus brought about a brutalizing worship of nature, exhibiting its degradation in the fact that man, the sovereign of nature, fell down on his knees in adoration of I take this to be Hanuman, the monkey, uh, and Shavala, the cow. Do you guys know who Shavala is? I do not. Do you know Martin? Yeah, you can tell me what it is. Because um, I've never known who that refers to. England, it is true, in causing a social revolution in Hindustan, was actuated only by the vilest interests and was stupid in her manner of enforcing them. But that is not the question. The question is, can mankind fulfill its destiny without a fundamental revolution in the social state of Asia? If not, whatever may have been the crimes of England, she was the unconscious tool of history in bringing about that revolution. That's probably the most famous passage from these writings. I would say for the most part, it this is just Marx, the true born son of Hegel speaking. 
Um, last time I was fortunate enough to speak here, some 14 years ago, I argued that the Indian question brought the post Seven Years War crisis of the British Revolution to a head. That crisis was, of course, resolved in the, in the direction of the consolidation of a new aristocratic oligarchy, of course, crucially through the American War. A new Toryism that, especially after the fall of Fox's ministry, which, of course, was occasioned by Fox's India Bill, reigned for half a century straight through to the passage of the Great Reform Bill in 1832. Marx himself, in the India series, remarks on how the India question is a kind of canker at the heart of the English Revolution, even going back prior to that. As he says of 1688, the Glorious Revolution, at that time, the East India Company excluded the common people from the commerce with India, revealing how in this, as well as in other instances, we find the first decisive victory of the bourgeoisie over the feudal aristocracy, coinciding with the most pronounced reaction against the people. Unquote. As the Anti-Corn Law League clearly expressed, that bourgeois oligarchy was not decisively overturned by the Reform Bill. Indeed, the inadequacy of the 1833 East India Company's Charter Bill had already shown that clearly enough. And there, of course, many other uh, rotten laws, especially poor laws, in the 30s. Nor was the political crisis fully resolved by the repeal of the Corn Laws, though here, liberalism itself began to waver and to grow. Nevertheless, when Marx encounters the India question debate, it still seems to be a strictly liberal question. As he wrote, that there is in India a permanent financial deficit, a regular oversupply of wars, and no supply at all of public works, an abominable system of taxation and a no less abominable state of justice and of law was settled beyond all doubt in the debates of 1853, as it had been in the debates of 1833 and the debates of 1813 and in all former debates on India. If the blob, the snake spit, in Leavenhall Street still had to be abolished, like Adam Smith and other British and American rap radicals from 1776 and prior had demanded that it be, so that the whole business of empire in the East could be brought under the cover of law and parliamentary responsibility. Already at that time, the British oligarchy's rule in India was as Marx said, opposed not only by rival ministers, but by a rival people. Now, the vastly more powerful bourgeoisie was powerless to advance. It could not satisfactorily address the Indian question now in the age of capital. In the, in the terms that Marx adopts in Das Kapital, Liberalism post-1848 was necessarily vulgar. For all of its resources and all the force of its critique, Manchester liberalism could not but be self-contradictory. As Marx wrote of John Bright's repost to the ministry's introduction of the bill, the speech and measures of Sir Charles Wood were subjected to a very strong and satirical criticism by Mr. Bright, whose picture of India ruined by the fiscal exertions of the company and government did not, of course, receive the supplement of India ruined by Manchester. 
should track. What Parto Chatterjee has called the anti-absolutist modern has now given way to the colonial one. Already in Central and Eastern Europe, Marx had seen how the loss of man's old world with no gain of a new one imparted a, to a particular kind of melancholy to the age of capital. The spokesperson for capital, quote, felt the necessity, the spokespeople for capital felt the necessity of creating fresh, fresh productive powers in India after having ruined her native industry. The arc of Marx's dozen articles on the 1853 debate is determined, of course, by the arc of the event itself. His first writing on the subject was in a composite piece entitled Affairs in Holland, Denmark, Conversion of the British Debt, India, Turkey, and Russia, and datelined London, May 24th, 1853. His conclusion to the series, the widely anthologized The Future Results of the British Rule in India, came almost exactly two months later. Marx came to the subject late, long after the liberal and chartist press had already begun to regularly agitate the question, and just some 10 days before the Aberdeen Ministry in the person of the President of the Board of Control, Sir Charles Wood, introduced its bit of what Marx viewed as a kind of anti-legislation. But while they are undated, Marx's reading notes show him to have prepared himself for some time before he first put pen to paper undertaking a sustained course of study on the subject, yes, of India, but more specifically, the Indian question. He read the numerous pamphlets, books, parliamentary reports, petitions from India, and surely a good deal of newspaper commentary, then directly informing the debate. He seems also to have attended some of the parliamentary debates himself, as would also be the case with his dispatches on the Eastern Question in the Crimean War later that year and throughout 1854, Marx at this time especially was supplying Tribune readers with well-considered commentary on the leading world events of his day. His was also a kind of meta-commentary on all other press coverage. Arguably, these early years were the high point of Marx's career as a professional journalist, though, as my volumes show, there's extremely valuable material scattered across the dozen odd years between the beginning of his professional writing and its conclusion at the time of the issues of the Emancipation Proclamation of the American Civil War in 1862, which is basically the point where Marx decides that politics has come back, that the counter revolution of the 1850s is over. At the end of that work, Marx gave clear indication as to his thinking on the subject of imperialism in relation to a different question, that of the US Civil War. Thus, in his peroration in the inaugural address to the International Working Men's Association, Marx wrote, if the emancipation of the working classes requires their fraternal concurrence, how are they to fulfill that great mission with a foreign policy in the pursuit of criminal designs, playing upon national prejudices and squandering in piratical wars the people's blood and treasure? It was not the wisdom of the ruling classes, but the heroic resistance. This is a reference to the British working classes' resistance to support to supporting the Confederacy, which the English ministry had tried to do. But their heroic resistance to their criminal folly by the working classes of England that saved Western Europe from plunging headlong into an infamous crusade for the perpetuation and propagation of slavery on the other side of the Atlantic. In other words, especially for Britain, foreign policy shows the necessity of what Marx would call political action. And this again would contribute to his 
critique of anarchism. Compare that with what Marx wrote nine years before in the future results of British rule in India. The Indians will not re reap the fruits of the new elements of society scattered among them by the British bourgeoisie till in Great Britain itself, the now ruling classes shall have been supplanted by the industrial proletariat or till the Hindus themselves shall have grown strong enough to throw off the English yoke altogether. At all events, we may safely expect to see, at a more or less remote period, the regeneration of that great and interesting country, whose gentle natives are, to use the expression of Prince Saltinghoff, even in the most inferior classes, plus fin et plus étroit que les Italiens, more subtle and adroit than the Italians, a people whose submission even is counterbalanced by a certain calm nobility, who, notwithstanding their natural languor, have astonished the British officers by their bravery, whose country has been the source of our languages and who represent the type of the ancient German in the job and the type of the ancient Greek in the Rome. Marx's articles conclude soon after Wood's India bill passed, and in that sense, after the issue was settled. On the surface, the matter was simple. British politics once again failed to expose the policy and practices of the company state, and thus it failed to adequately legislate. British and Indian liberals championed in the House of Commons by John Bright could not break down the resistance to inquire mounted in Parliament. The immediate demand had turned on the matter of information. What the radicals sought preliminarily was a postponement of legislation until a full-scale inquiry, above all, inquiry in India, was complete. And precisely this was evaded. The ministry rushed through a bill that made superficial reforms most importantly, appointment and promotion by merit rather than by patronage and seniority alone, though, of course, the exams can only be taken in Britain. Nothing essential as regards the civil rights, as regards civil rights in India, was secured, but not because the liberals lost the debate. As Marx observed, the division, i.e., the vote, Leaving ministers a majority of 322 versus 142 was an inverse ratio to the discussion. During the discussion, all was thistles for the ministry, and Sir Charles Wood was the ass officially put to the task of feeding upon them. In the division, all is roses, and Sir Charles Wood receives the crown of another money. In other words, the vote doesn't re reflect the debate. The same men who negatived the plan of the ministry by their arguments affirmed it by their votes. None of its supporters dared to apologize for the bill itself. On the contrary, all apologized for supporting it. The one because it was an infinitesimal part of a measure in the right direction, the others because it was no measure at all. The desired policy changes would be taken up, if at all, not by civil society, but by Sir Charles Wood, Lord Dalhousie, and the existing bureaucracy. And of course, they did a lot of it soon after this, the education department. Uh, was established, a great deal of railroads were built, blah, 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 coming out of the critique of, 18, of 1853, but all coming down through the Indian bureaucracy. Rather than giving scope to civil society to undertake reforms or even to freely agitate for them in the press, reformers had to rest content with Sir Charles Wood's doubtless sincere commitment to undertake the needed reforms of, as he said, the greatest magnitude and importance. In the same way, 
it was left to Louis Bonaparte to institute what Marx called imperial socialism in France. Both the liberal Manchester Examiner and Times and the Chartist Reynolds Weekly, Reynolds Weekly treated the income as just another victory for aristocratic government. But even as it was just another illiberal resolution or postponement of the, of the Indian question, history had also moved beyond that. As Marx remarked, Marx remarked as follows on the crisis of liberalism with respect to the Indian question. Go through the pamphlets published by the India Reform Association, he wrote, and you will feel a similar sensation as when hearing of one great act of accusation against Bonaparte devised by the legitimists, the Orleanists, the blue and red Republicans, and even the disappointed Bonapartists. Their only merit until now has been to draw public attention to Indian affairs in general, and further, they cannot go. While they attack the English doings of the English aristocracy in India, they protest against the destruction of the Indian aristocracy of native princes. That was a kind of hobby for us liberals at the time, like the issue of the fate of the Raja of Sadhana, et cetera. Rather than preoccupy themselves with the preservation of greatness by birth, Marx argued, radicals ought to be concerned to foster modern intelligentsia and political class in India remarking that, quote, for all fresh requirements, it is necessary to create a fresh class, adding that from Indians, acuteness and manifest aptness to learn this can be done in India as it can be in no other country, unquote. By the time Bright's project of enfranchising the working class came to fruition with the second reform bill, India had, at least for a time, been set beyond all reach of the reformers by the specter of the 1857 revolt. The so-called crown rule that was extended to India in the wake of that cataclysmic event was a travesty of what liberals had demanded as a genuine extension of British law and the British constitution to India since the 1760s. Equally important, the second reform bill helped to solidify the British working class as the only one in the industrialized world that would fail to constitute the Socialist Party in the final decades of the 19th century. It effectively thwarted Marx's efforts in the first international to provide independent leadership for the British working class, which was instead subordinated to the Liberal Party for the balance of the century. When the question of independent socialist politics was, uh, was posed unmistakably by the Paris Commune and Marx's address on it, delivered in the International in London, it lost him definitively the English support on which he had so long in the line in that body. But it go on too long. I uh, basically agree with you. Say that. Is it working? The microphone? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the object of uh, criticism um, was something that was very different from the understanding of imperialism in the previous I also agree with you that in the 1850s, right, uh, Marx's position uh, in his criticism of the rule in India, especially the 
criticism of the East Indian Company was essentially a liberal position, right? Um, to be really good. The, there are two questions that we are now trying to ask. First is, if that is so, then why were these writings uh, fairly widely read in the 20th century? Um, and despite the criticism of Marx as being Orientalist or not strictly informed about it, and so on, all of the things there, despite them, why did these writings still provide a certain reading? We can call it a mystery, but a reading which was seen to contribute to what became an Indian community. So that is a question that needs to be answered. Uh, because it's, it's not just that these were these these articles were reprinted or in various edited versions uh, in countries like India. These were actually certainly extremely cheap editions from Progress Publishers Boston. Uh, that's the edition we read in the 1960s. Uh, now, so that's one. And the second is. You haven't, you met, you talked about Marx in the 1850s. You haven't mentioned the so called late Marx, Marx of the 1870s, right? When he resumed his studies of India and Russia, right? And of course, he didn't publish it. But uh, then behind the book books and so on, which is an interesting to study. And they don't seem to indicate that he was still following it at the same time. In other words, it could be argued that what he wrote in the 1850s as the criticism of British rule in India under the company, that was the, the debate at the time. The kinds of, it certainly left in Marx's uh, mind a whole range of other questions, right, which he resumed to investigate in the 1870s. Of course, many of these things were, uh, there were no definitive conclusions or answers, as uh, you said, uh, we never published it, of course. Uh, but that remains another question. So, those are the two questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to treat it as three questions the Marx's liberalism. Uh, in the 1850s, uh, how these reading, how these works were received in the 20th century, uh, in recent scholarship on late Marx. Of course, it's not nothing is is, is really new, but um, there has been a, a, a for instance, uh, Marcelo Mustos recently published a book, and there has been some writing on this. Um, My argument is that the elements of the critique of capitalism are the, of, of Marx's critique of capitalism are, in a sense, all deriving from liberals. Uh, in that it's a, it, it, it's the, uh, that Marx's critique or Marx's dialectic emerges out of the self consciousness contradiction of the liberal dialogue. So, uh, and I, I, I think that goes back to the 1840s, that, that Marx believes that it's impossible to advance beyond Hegel as a liberal, that the young Hegelian's attempt to uh, go beyond Hegel is actually falling below the threshold. And, and, and Marx repeats that criticism over and over again of socialism that, uh, when they claim to be going beyond, they're actually falling below the threshold. And here, the most you know the most important element of that would be uh, free trade. Right, that, that that liberalism is international. Right, and the question is, are we? Right, that it is embodies a liberal cosmopolitan project. So I don't take it as a slur against Marx to say that his critique of any question is liberal. I, mean, I think ultimately even the critique of the, 
as it were, the economy is liberal because it's about the violation of the property rights of workers. Right? It's about the crisis. Uh, I'm well. I think Moy should be much more liberal than me. I mean, I'm much more. I mean, you know, I I don't think that um, I don't think that Marx exactly advances beyond the liberals. Right. I think he identifies the crisis of the bourgeois revolution on a world historic scale, uh, and I don't think that that's the way that that, that Moish would view it. Though Moish was my teacher, and you know. Um, I, I have, uh, you know, I, I had nothing but respect. I have nothing but respect for him. Um, but, um, you know, I argued with all my teachers, uh, and including Moish. The question of the 20th century reception is a really interesting one. Um, I would say you know, just a couple of things. The India writings are, I mean, there's a there's a deep history of, or not a deep history, but there's an earlier history of the rediscovery of, of Marx's journalism, uh, which goes back to his daughter, Eleanor Marx. And I, what I take to be files of newspaper clippings that she discovered uh, in the papers that were left to her by Uncle Fred. Um, and that resulted in a number of publications in the 1890s um, on Lord Palmerston, uh, the series that he wrote on, on Lord Palmerston, but most importantly on the Eastern question and the Crimean War. And, and it, it was really the inadequacies of her editing of that that led to um, the development of what we might call Marxological interests in uh, the Bolshevik uh, David Ryazanov, who eventually was the director of, of the Marx Engels Institute. Uh, and so in that sense, it was like the Crimean War writings, which nobody's paid any attention to since, except me, uh, that originally sparked the interest in this material. But Ryazanov, you know, he, all of them, they, they, there was a copy of the New York Tribune in London. There was a file, but it was always, it, 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 was, it was not complete. So Ryazanov had tried to do, had tried to complete uh, or perfect or improve upon Eleanor Marx's research by going to London. And he discovered that the material there was inadequate. So one of the things he did when he was at the uh, Marx Engels Institute was he had, he contacted his colleagues at the New York Public Library and he bought a complete file from America of the New York Tribune. And he hired a young communist named Fox uh, to, to come and help him with them. And Fox is very important in the development of the Progressive Writers Association, people like Zahir, meeting them in Oxford in the 20s. Uh, eventually he was killed in, in, in Spain. He is the one who gave a copy, who gave a set to Mukhraj Anand, who was a, a kind of a fellow traveler in the period of the Popular Front. Uh, in the mid 30s. Mugraj Anand uh, published the India writings, basically the essence of what I'm looking at here, uh, together with some nationalists, um, Piyari Lal Bedi, a Punjabi uh, nationalist who was studying at Oxford and married an Englishwoman named Freda, I forget her, um, her. Hmm? I forget her original surname, one of my, her married name, but she became Freda Beatty. Books are being written about her just because she's a white woman involved in Indian nationalism, I think. Uh, but those two edited a set almost at the same time. And of course, Rajne Palme Dutt came out with the, with the volume that you're talking about that was widely circulated by communist publishers. Uh, by the late 30s and reprinted numerous times. Uh, 
No, I, I think that these writings are great. I think that most, if not all, of the fundamental arguments against imperialism are present in the 1853 debate. I certainly would say that every all of the economic arguments that some that we associate with people like Dadabai Norochi are already being made. Right. Um, the drain of wealth is there, you know, there's there, there and there wouldn't be any reason why they would be there. I, I don't understand why people think that these arguments have to wait until later. They don't. Now, of course, part of it is the dominance of the Congress and Congress Party preoccupied. Uh, histories of the freedom movement and the like, um, but I also think that there's there's been um, inadequate attention paying, especially to the arguments emanating out of out of Bombay and in Manchester. Um, so those arguments are still good coin of the realm, I would argue, against imperialism in the in the 1920s and 30s. Marx reads well because he's reading well a very sophisticated debate. Um, the, you know, the, the, the reception is colored by, I think, the pop front and, and the communist role in the Congress Socialists and so forth. And so, you know, it, it's always the trickiness of like, you know, I, I guess I would say, you know, you can always read Marx as like a good comrade, right? He's there making an argument we can all agree with, right? Uh, but then there's Marx, I would say, the bad comrade, right? Marx, who's like really critical of socialism, right? Who's the critic of the left, right? Who isn't just like going out to sell the newspaper with you on the street corner or whatever, right? Who, who, who isn't just down with the program. Right, but is always criticizing. And I think that that is lost in the 1850s because I think people don't take seriously the extent to which, you, I guess part of it was that um, the Great Depression is also muting a lot of basic arguments about the need for capital investment. Right, and instead you're getting an argument about the need for protection, and that argument's already coming out of World War One. Uh, the the background for Marx is a, in some sense a more kind of late, you know, it may, maybe resonates more with the kind of a 1990s or 2000s India, uh, in that you know Marx and the Manchester liberals are talking about in capital investment. Right, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about you can't get a, a mound of cotton out of Kandesh without immense expenditures on bullet parts that may or may not deliver that cotton to Bombay in usable condition because of the horrific state of the roads. Right. We need, of course, branch lines, et cetera, or railways built to the cotton districts, which they do. Um, those are the things that John Bright is talking about. Those are the things that the Indian Reform Society is talking about. And I think that, uh, you know, that sense of the need to attract investment. Um, and the need to, you know, the, 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 the lack of purchasing power of the Indians is a crisis, right? They're, they constantly cite these figures about how the Brazilians buy 20 times more per person per capita than the Indians do from, you know, these are classic, what you would call um, informal empire, you know, informal imperialism arguments. About the late Marx, I don't think, um, I try as much as possible to read Marx through the lens of Marxism, through the lens of Lenin, Luxembourg, Trotsky, the great Marxists 
of Europe, who to me had higher debates than we will ever have uh, about orthodoxy. Right? They argued about what Marx meant on a very high level, up to and including a world historic level, because they were as absurd as it may sound, right? Marxism is a religion. People settle arguments by quoting Marx, right? Marxism made history through what it called the revisions to speed, through arguments about orthodoxy. I would follow Lenin, basically, and say, there is no change in Marx and Engels. There's no such thing as a late Marx. Right? There's one change in Marx and Engels. It's the results of the revolution of 1848. It's the understanding of the necessity of forming a working class party that Marx writes about in 1850. It's the argument about Bonapartism, et cetera. Right? This is what feeds into Marx's saying, you know, his self-criticism of the Communist Manifesto, et cetera. Right, that's the only change in Marx's thought. The rest of it's just a deepening or like, evolution. That would be my answer. And I worked with those scholars on those writings. They got, you know, I'm gonna, let me tell you this part. They got, I'm not going to mention his name, a fellow graduate student of mine who was hopelessly right wing. And they, um, and the, and Marx's notes were talking about the, uh, Aryan invasion of the South. And, you know, I, I, I think the guy's name was Young Husband, maybe. I forget the writer. He it wasn't as prominent of an Indian historian as we would like, the one who falls into his hands and he writes the long notes uh, in the 1870s. And this uh, right wing classmate of mine at the University of Chicago was producing all these notes about how. Uh, you know, this was what the Ramayana was really about, and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you cannot possibly put this, put Marx's name on any publication with these notes. And so I chastised this idiot American Marxist who had handed this project just to an Indian because he was an Indian, right? Now he'll know, right? And I was like, no, 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 <laughs> he can't allow that. Uh, these notes are. Quite frankly, there really, there's really very little there. Uh, what you get is Marx copying out long passages, and then from time to time, he will just say English blockheads or something in parentheses. Like, there's practically nothing after you take out the block quotes other than Marx's you know, vitriol, which he expresses remarkably in Russian especially when he's reading Kovalevsky, who also talks about India, uh, or German, or English, or French, as he chooses. Um, but I, I don't think that, you know, this attempt, I think Marx's argument, right, what are they complaining about? They're saying that Marx believed that the revolution would emanate from Europe and it would spread all over the world, and that didn't happen. He had a unilinearist conception of world revolution, and that failed. And so Marx is wrong, and his continued belief in that is racist. It just doesn't exist. This argument doesn't exist. Marx knows that modern society is disintegrating in the core of capital. Right. And obviously, it doesn't even spread to Germany. Right. That's his experience in 1848 is that revolution isn't, isn't, isn't spreading to Germany and modern bourgeois society is disintegrating in the core, which is what gives rise to imperialism. Right. What gives rise to imperialism is the criminality of masses of unemployed people, right? The proletarianization and lumpenization, the lumpenization of the working classes in the heart of capital. That's what gives rise to you know, core elements of imperialism, like the cops, like the police, right? That's right. When, when you know, Marx is looking at the emergence of 
what Marxists call bodies of armed men to manage capitalism, right? That's happening at this time. It's why the British call the cops bodies, right? Because the cops were instituted by Sir Robert Peel, right? They were bodies men, right? It's that problem that's really at the core, right? That militarism and that force that's coming into the core of the state that Marx sees as a reversal of the historic trend of the subordination of the state to society, which had been the aspiration of the bourgeoisie in, the, in its revolutionary phase, if you Sorry, that was a long-winded, but there was a lot there. Uh, I'm sure it wasn't <laughs> adequate. You said a quick couple of things. I'm looking at the modern marks, but the way you're telling the story, yeah. very interesting. The three things that going through the time, um, if I'm correctly on what you're arguing, obviously there's the idea of the Fulfillment in the new law of capital. There's a story of the uh, the possibility uh, the, the possibility of uh, proletarian-like creations because of the footprints of capital across the world. But the one that you're really focused on today, and now that you've said, actually helps eliminate that point, which is that there is a, a consistent demand. And a very consistent critique of imperialism that, that, in fact, with India, I do, which you can say that what she is writing in 53 is actually consistent with even when they write it right after the, the near to the end. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, but don't you find that, he, I don't know when they were put together, but First case from Marxist multimedia history uh, put together. Um, the writings of the three writings, the Polonian writings, the tribute. Are there certain nuances that you see in Marx's understanding of what it's worth pointing out? And the other thing I would say that isn't that some of that also laying the ground for other critiques of imperialism, which come in the form of liberalism, like Asia Hobson? And then, of course, Lenin's idea of, of you know, the cartels of the great banks and finance capital, which, and, you know, that, that to me is another important, I would want to listen to some of this, but I think we we'll get to where we can be essential. Would you care to comment on, I mean, do you think that Marx is learning something here? Because, you know, I understand that, that you know, Marx's thinking is, you know, very rigorous in a particular sense, um, and in here. But I'm so sort of curious if we have mm -hmm. picked up some other, you know. I mean, I, I think that, um, I mean, the mutiny or the revolt is. I, I guess you could say an occasion for learning, right? Uh, I mean, it's a it's a world historic event. So I, I wouldn't say that um, Marx is looking at the same object, right? He's looking at in 1853 at a society. Right? So a lot of the quotes that I've read, you know, emphasize the docility of Indians, right? That comes out very strongly. Right, uh, that you, you know, he's not going to say that in 1857 or 58. You know, behind it is the, the you know the bigger you know the other event that I would say like really conditions uh, his thinking about um, 1857 58 is the Taiping Rebellion um, that. He he's beginning to get, to get a sense of the depth of the social crisis in China in the 1850s, right? That's not it, there's a piece on India and China which is really nice and a kind of lovely little Hegelian study. That's the first in 
section on India in my book, and that's the only mention of China. But it, really, by the 57, right, the scale of the mortality in China, of the upheaval, right, in he and Ingalls are, are thinking about this, right? They're thinking about, you know, how do we want to talk? How, how should we? How should we describe it? The, the wrenching and violent yet directionless, politically speaking, character of these upheavals in Asian society. Right? They keep looking to the question of does this point anywhere? Right, it, it, I, I voiced this passage, the famous passage on the present misery of the Hindu, right, is that the old world has passed away and no new world has taken its place. And he sees that, um, that historical crisis and abyss as being almost deliberately taken up in the violence of the 1850s in Asia that it's churning this problem that the old world is passing away and no new world is coming into being, that, that bourgeois social relations are not really crystallizing and promising a way forward for society, right? So I, I would say that, you know, certainly he's looking at the whole of it. Uh, what people don't really think about is the way that he's also always tracking the European response. So when you take the Indian revolt writings and you put them between two covers, what you've missed is that Marx frames the whole thing against the background of what was known as the Chinese election of 1857, which was the outbreak of the Second Opium War, the Arrow War, as it's sometimes called, which prompted Lord Palmerston, who Marx thinks of as in the, there's it's the vanguard of the, of, of the Bonapartization of the British state, causes Palmerston to dissolve parliament and he, and he turns to the country and makes an openly jingoistic appeal about how we have to vindicate the rights of the English flag in China. And he's elected on that basis. Uh, and Marx views it as, as really the sort of definitive analog to the election of Louis Bonaparte as right? That, there, that, that at this point in British political society has in a sense become not only, has become Bonapartist in and for itself, right? It's self-consciously so. And all, and Bright and all of the liberals are voted out in that. And so all the bloodthirstiness that Marx is looking at in terms of the English, you know, so he looks at the, the bloodlust of English society around the Indian revolt, right? If, if you read those, he's really preoccupied with the way that British society is cheering on the final suppression of the revolt so that the aristocrats that are the officers of the army are trying to restrain the, and in the House of Lords, that the aristocracy is horrified by the bloodlust of society, right? And that is all conditioned by this Chinese election and this depth of the counter-revolution in, in, in Britain. Um, you know, that's the government that is trying to bring Britain in on the side of the Confederacy when the American Civil War breaks out. About Lenin, um, I would say that when Lenin says imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism, what he's saying is that the, con that the, the epoch of imperialism has become adequate to itself. So it's been imperialist since 1848, but in the age of mass political parties for socialism, the potential of imperialism as the, as it were, 
negative presence of the dictatorship of the proletariat. It, it's, it's in that way that it's becoming adequate. It is becoming the final stage of capitalism. Right. That, so it's not that he's saying there's a phase that's imperialist that isn't wasn't there after 1848. So Lenin doesn't disagree with Marx. He's just saying the essence of Marx's concept is that the, as it were, the, the inner truth of the empire is the dictatorship of the proletariat. And that's what's being revealed in World War One. Right. That on the one hand, the world state is not right. So on the one hand, it's the full realization of imperialism. What is what does imperialism as a world state look like? Well, it doesn't look like peace. It looks potentially like war, right? It doesn't contradict the concept of world state for Marx for it to be a war, right? At all, right? On the contrary, he sees most of the wars of the 19th century is what he calls fake wars, right? That all that they are fighting for is to boost every party's strength over society, over the working class, right? That's the way he understands the Crimean War. Now, of course, they can't really control it. And World War I reveals that, right? World War I reveals that capitalism going beyond all control of the ruling classes and laying the groundwork for, of course, as Lenin expected, um, turning the war into a European civil war. He is, the dialectic of that text is that he plays off Hobson against Tilford. Right, um, that the revisionists within socials represented by Hilferding are in many ways worse than the liberals represented by Hobson. Right, so he uses Hobson to criticize Hilferding's affirmation of capitalism. Right, Hobson at least inhabits the liberal horror of war, right? Because he's writing that after the Boer War right? and rightly seeing the Boer War as laying the foundation for future wars. So um, I, I don't, I don't think that that, I'd say that that book is the least well-read book I mean, obviously, there's a thousand, there, well, there are at least four Lenins, right? There's the state revolution, there's the anarchists Lenin, there's the conservatives Lenin, you know, they like left wing communism and infantile disorder, there's the kind of third worldist Maoist Lenin, they like the imperialism pamphlet. And then, you know, there's the sectarians Lenin, what is to be done, they like, you know, uh, democratic centralism, whatever that's supposed to mean anymore. Uh, but I think that there is a Lenin who is coherent, and he's coherent as a Marxist, as a student of Marx. Um, and, and that's how I would read. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, so, uh, actually, one comment and one So, the comment is that if we go back to the different parts that you put in your book. I quite uh, empathize with you in terms of uh, not making an unusual distinction between the two parts of the past. If you go back to the 1840s and I think Marx's first speech as a journalist in the new line, right? Now, it seems to be a very quintessential liberal in the sense that he's speaking in the censorship laws. Uh, is basically defending, most likely defending the uh, freedom of the press. Like here, here you have a, a liberal mass with a cultural critique. And in the 50s writing, it seems that you have a liberal mass with political critique. Now, so there seems to be a kind of uh, change already, the context has also changed. So I think if you can also make reflections on this kind of 
changes in mass itself was going to pull the spontaneous change was moved from uh, from Germany to England now. Um, so that's my problem. But the query is that uh, does Marx explicitly use the term imperialism, right? Of course, we we know that uh, he is definitely using colonialism, colonial thunder, wars, and colonial wars. But I'm not quite sure, given the fact that the kind of I, that I'm not sure whether there's any uh, off late any research that has actually shown that Marx has used imperialism as a category. Uh, and I, I should be careful, right? Obviously, Marx, Karl Marx is not a liberal, right? Karl Marx is a socialist. Goals of socialism are, I would say, only specifiable as the completion of the bourgeois revolution. Pacified social relations, world peace, Etc. Right. You can when you are trying to specify what socialism is, what you're talking about is bourgeois society as it should be, or you're talking about something that actually can't be put in quotes, like a world beyond labor. Right. They're just negations. Right. Um, what I would say is, and obviously politically. He's not a liberal, right? He's identifying a concept, the real core political essence of a concept of imperialism is a recognition that there's something called capitalist politics and the working class can have nothing to do with it, right? That the working class has to develop independent politics, right? And that it cannot administer capitalism, right? That's the that's the Marxism that comes out of the 1848 experience, right? Um, it's also a critique of democracy, right? So what I would try to what I try to suggest is that at the farthest reaches of John Bright's politics, and this is actually where he's going beyond his comrade Cobb. Is the demand for universal suffrage, right? That's implied actually in the critique of the India question and the unrepresentative character of Parliament that Bright does talk about, right? He says like this is a landlord's Parliament. Of course, he says that, right? It's the old language, the anti corn law language, um, and he is instrumental in the passage of the Second Great Reform Bill, which very substantially. Uh, moves towards universal male suffrage. And for Marx, right, so, so Marx had gone into the 1848 revolution in that sense as a Democrat, right? He said, if you read the Communist Manifesto very carefully, he's not talking about a party, or he's talking about, in a sense, the, a kind of a left Jacobinism, right? That, that, this, that the working class is going to be the left wing of the, of the revolutionary forces and push them. He breaks with that, right? He says, no, we have to have our own party, right? In my interest in second part, he talks about the relationship between the second and the only party. Right, but that, the business about just pointing out the line of March, right? We form no party of our own, right? We just find out, like, right? That's not going to be the March of later years, right? Um, so, you know, there, like I said, there, there is an important break with the experience of the revolution of 1848. Um, I would say that like, and, and that does turn, as I try to suggest on the, on the category of democracy, right? Whether you can understand the modern revolution as just a radical extension of democracy. And I would say to a large degree, like that's how Marx is getting liquidated in the 20th century, right? There's a kind of a returning, a kind of a liquidation of that critique of democracy. Um, it's easy to rediscover now, right? I'll just say as an aside, because now we all know we do not want to be governed by what the other guy thinks. 
like our hatred of democracy is like much more manifest in you know the age of Trump and Modi, et cetera, right? Where we're like, oh crap, you think I have to be governed by what the majority thinks. Right? That seems catastrophic. But that's of course not much to critique of democracy. Oh, but it does uh, mean that leftists are forced to rediscover a lot of their own, their older preoccupations with the rights of minorities, with civil rights, like the right to free speech, the right to assemble, right? all of these things, uh, liberal rights, which are contradicted by democracy potentially. The, dealing Marx in terms of his development out of liberalism, I think, is, is there are deeper continuities, right, which is what allows Marx to make so many insightful remarks already in 1844 and 1847, um, is, is his confrontation with, and his, I think, profound self-consciousness of the inability to advance, all, you know, like originally philosophy. Uh, Hegelian philosophy, right? which is, is, I think, where he, you know, the, the kind of the ground where he originally recognizes I'm in a new epoch. Right? He wanted to be the son of Rousseau and Kant and Hegel. They all did. Right? Um, they wanted to advance that project. And Marx is obviously so mm -hmm. conscious of the inability to do that. Right in the 1840s, that there's something new, right? So what I've tried to suggest in what I just what I just presented is that Marx's category of the historical new circumstance that he is tasked with being self-conscious of, the categories are class struggle, right? Which he'll just say, class struggle begins in like 1836. He doesn't mean some, it's been happening since the dawn of time, right? He means the emergence of the working class as, in, as a specific site of the expression of discontent, right? That there's a split within the third estate in the name of which the modern revolution has been made. What, what is that a symptom of? And what it's a symptom of is what he calls capital, right? which is a condition of freedom itself being contradictory. Now, a lot of that thought, I think, is deeply continuous through Marx's whole thinking, right? That in, in that sense, it's a Hegelian reflection on the impossibility of advancing the Hegelian project it's a dialectical reflection on the crisis of the dialectic, right? It's that those sorts of, uh, you know, Hegel squared kind of dimension of Marx's thought, right? Which is why I'm like deliberately rejecting all anti-Hegelian arguments, Althusserian, et cetera, right? right? They're just not Marxism as far as I'm concerned, right? Um, that, that it is a kind of self-consciousness crisis, right? And the crisis of what? The crisis of liberalism, the crisis of historical freedom, the crisis of being able to redefine what it means to be human in historical time, right? That's not democracy, that's liberal, right? That, that concern, that, the Galen concern with historic freedom. And that's, I think, at the core of Marx's concern, right? That this society regresses and disintegrates. Sorry. But... In, in the, a few Mathematicians that was one of the I need because uh, I'm a brain historian. Uh, so one thread throughout what you presented today was to do with the various charter acts. So you had from 1813, 1833, 
Somebody can Google it. Uh, <laughs> after you... Historical energy, one sentence has been relaxed, which may be curious. Okay, we'll have to look that up, see if I'm being dishonest. Um, the reason why I, I want to write this in relation to you know the Charter Act debates and the Indian the English debate is because um In, I think in a very important way, um, Marx, what I'm trying to suggest is that um, that there really isn't a Marxist argument, right? Um, that it's, it's an interesting sight to think about the relationship of critique to liberalism. Now, what is it? What is liberalism, right? The way I'm using it, right? I'm using it in what I take, I'm, I'm using it uh, basically as an analog or even a synonym, to be honest, uh, with Marxist category of bourgeois ideology, right? Marxist category of bourgeois ideology is, is an epochal category that refers to the thinking that accompanies the self-consciousness of the emergence of modern society, ultimately, of course, invested into the project of advancing it. Uh, he studies that most intensely with respect to political economy, but it's a category that goes beyond political economy. Um, we might also use categories like the enlightenment, right, to talk about the world, you know, the, the intellectual context from, say, the late Cromwellian period up through the 1830s, right? Um, that 
is also an era of explicitly non-religious reform revolutions, right? Like John Locke and Lawrence Revolution. Now, Marx's criticism of that thinking is simply that when we that we still have to that we still think that way, right? That to the extent that there's society at all, it is bourgeois, and, and we have bourgeois social relations, and we have thought that goes with it, and and so we're constantly trying to create, let's say, Adam Smith's world. And by that we, I mean socialists. Socialists are trying to create a world in which everyone has a job and it pays well, right? That's Adam Smith's world. That's Adam Smith's project of, of emancipation through labor, right? Um, and Marx doesn't think that that's like a mistake, right? He thinks that's the world, right? That's what the revolution is. The revolution is the repetition of bourgeois revolution. It's just 1776 or 1789 come again, except now it's self-contradictory. The project of trying to advance along in, in those terms forces a regression back into pre-bourgeois forms, imperialism, the rule of Louis Bonaparte. Right, the, 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 it, we have to clarify the, the task of the proletarian revolution. Right? And so, as an image at the beginning of the 18th Brumaire, right, that the working class throws its antagonist to the ground, it rises up more strongly each time, right, because the more you try to, in a sense, advance bourgeois revolution, the more you're confronting its self contradiction. So, the way I'm using liberal is in terms of bourgeois ideology. Marx uses that category to denote the most advanced thinkers of the time. Right. Adam Smith is a revolutionary from, uh, from Marx. Adam Smith is just as revolutionary as Karl Marx is from Karl Marx's own perspective. Right. He identified the task of freedom and advanced it intellectually, theoretically. The fact that that project has become self-contradictory and there's now a new project isn't Adam Smith's problem, it's our problem, right? So when Marx uses categories like bourgeois ideology, they're not dismissive, they're not contemptuous at all, right? He's saying those people who created that revolution, which thankfully has given us a new project. And of course, he's an optimist. He thinks we're gonna solve our freedom problem and we're gonna achieve socialism, right? Uh, so that's what I would say is that he, he, and so what's his interest in someone like John Bright? His interest in John Bright is that John Bright believes he's the heir of Adam Smith. Right? That's what he believes. He believes that Adam Smith is an argument for free trade capitalism. Marx is saying, no, Adam Smith is an argument for the historical evolution of freedom. And if you're trying to advance that project of freedom in some sort of rote way, like, well, did Marx, I mean, Smith said this, and Smith said that, and Smith said the third thing, you're betraying the spirit of Adam Smith. John Bright is falling below the threshold of Adam Smith. He's vulgar. That's what he's saying, right? It's become a class, it's become a, a project for one class's domination of another, which it wasn't for Smith. That's the that's the apocal terms of it. Uh, the reason why I want to tell the story is because I just think that. They're really isn't like, I'll put it to you this way. If you read Marx's critique of political economy, like where he's supposedly at his dialectical best, it reads for all the world like political economy. Right, like where's the, where's the Marx there? It's 
at an extra textual level, right? There's no, there, like I said, there's there's like not a sentence that like you can. There, there isn't a thing that you can say that's like Marxist, like that a liberal can't say. But there's not a critique of the Indian question that Marx has that's ultimately any different than a liberal's critique. Right? If we just said, like, well, we thought we, we don't think about these things because we have so little faith in humanity, right? We don't think that other people are rational. We don't want to be like in a common project of like self-determination with them, right? We live in a very atomized and deeply um, misanthropic society. The kind of like goodwill and faith, goodwill towards and faith in our fellow men that like Adam Smith just took for granted. We don't have it, right? Because we look at our fellow man if we're workers as someone who's getting ready to take our job, right? That's just not, we live in a, in a different world than they do. And we often think like, I guess what I would say is that at this point, both liberalism and socialism, we have been taught by a degenerate and declining new left to believe are the problem. And what I think is like most needed intellectually is to feel the full force of what has been traduced in its rejection. Right, what has been, you know, like, oh, it's a, you know, what, what did they say? You know, it, it's, it's a um, grand narrative, right? All of these, like, all of these, like, dismissals that I was trained on, like, all this illiberalism and anti-socialism that, like, were really the, the, the essence of education in the 1990s and 2000s here, right? was like the in, imposition of thought taboos and um, dogma. And at this point where I just feel like, you know, we live in like a highly, like a big crisis, like nobody cares what intellectuals say at all, like at all. Like, I think in America, they're, like, the right is just ready to shut the universities down as Democratic Party think tanks, which is what they are. Um, I feel like you know, we really have to ask ourselves, right, what was that revolutionary thought about? Because this, this 20th century revolution is like a big mess. Like it really is. Right, like, I think the affirmation that, like, oh, this makes this makes sense as progress, I, I just can't inhabit anymore. So, for me, like, you know, to brush that history against the grain, you know, I'll I'll take Ram Mohan Roy in many ways over over Gandhi. Right, I think these people are more radical, like in profound ways. Right, they have deeper faith in the future. Right. And they have a, a, a profounder project. So that's, I, I guess, why I think that it's not a slur to say that like Marx is inheriting liberals. Right. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Students, any students in the back? Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you for your indulgence.